But I'm just so impressed, I guess, on how fluid the kingdom of God can be. Um, there's no obstruction, there's no obstacles that can really get in our way from seeing God do something, seeing God do miracles in everybody's lives, whether it be uh, in the community or in your home. Um, and let's continue to believe, let's continue to run our race, let's continue to persevere and believe that God can do exceptionally more than we can ever do or dream or imagine. And it's really about the kingdom of God today, isn't it? Um, this past week, Pastor Ann started the series of expanding the kingdom, and I believe that irrespective of what's going on in our society today, in the international capacity or within our economies, it's not going to stop the kingdom of God from expanding. It's not going to stop His people from moving. It's not going to stop His people from believing and encouraging and taking bold steps and taking moments of sacrifice to believe that God is the one and true solution uh, for our world today. And so we're going to be speaking into that today. Matthew 25 is what we're going to be starting off with today. Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13. And this is what it says in Matthew. It says, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but not, did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oils, uh, oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. How often do we fall asleep and get a bit tired in pursuing the things of God and the things of His kingdom? At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps, got their lamps ready, got them lit. And the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps have gone out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some yourself. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins, were ready, the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others all also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the doors for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, therefore. Keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. It's a challenging verse, isn't it? But the thing that I really want to lock into for the first part of this morning is I want to just broaden our understanding of what it means to be part of the kingdom of God, part of or walking in the kingdom of heaven, walking in His grace, walking in His direction, in His mercy, in His kindness. Because the kingdom of God is also the kingdom of heaven. Matthew refers to the kingdom of heaven but actually, that's because of a cultural phenomenon that he was trying to tackle in the moment when the Bible talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It's really talking about the same thing. But Jesus talks about the kingdom of God more often than any other topic in the Bible. Why? Because it's understanding the acceptance and the obedience of his lordship and his sovereignty over our lives. Understanding the kingdom of God, what it is, what it isn't, and why it matters is actually so critically important to us as believers to actually live a truly Christian life. The kingdom of God is neither a location or it's not a future establishment, but it's actually understanding that it's something that is within us, that when we understand that it's about giving control of us understanding the, what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong, we begin to understand that the kingdom of God is actually within us. That when we make choices, when we are guided, when we are, are, are moved in a certain conviction, that the thing that is within us, our body and our spirit, is the kingdom of God. And when we submit those things and we surrender those things to God, that's when the kingdom of God begins to invade our hearts. It begins to invade our lives. And all of a sudden, the choices that we are making weren't the choices that we used to make before, but all of a sudden, they've been prioritized not towards ourselves, but towards God and His purpose and His conviction and His commission in our lives. But it's funny, though, this whole concept of control, this whole concept of understanding the kingdom and our position in it is has actually been a tension point throughout history, all the way from Adam and Eve, all the way through to where we are now. 
that tension of control, that tension of surrendering control or taking control has really been a focal point since Adam and Eve were around. So I read, let's kind of lock into to, to what that story is all about because you guys kind of know that story of Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve, Adam was created in the garden and he, uh, he was given a partner. God take, t- took a rib from Adam, made him fall asleep, took a rib and created, it e- created Eve. And Adam kind of said, look at her, my bone of my bone, my flesh of my flesh, you are now mine and I am yours. And so God progresses to actually give them control to actually steward and, and manage and, and grow and multiply his kingdom, his garden, his creation. He actually gave us control of his creation, the very thing that was in his heart, the very thing that was in his mind, and the very thing that he loved, he gave to us because he loved us that much more. And so he gives us that. But the tension comes in where Adam and Eve approach the tree of the knowledge of the good and ev- of good and evil. And Satan comes along and says, no, he, he gives a deception in this moment. And he says, no, nothing will change if you had that fruit. But we are challenged to believe that when we talk about the word knowledge, in Hebrew, that word is actually yada, Y-A-D-A. And in that Hebrew translation, it doesn't really mean knowledge. It means the right to, to, to choose. So God had this fruit and the deception that Adam and Eve were given was that actually no, they had the right to choose what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. God had given them complete control over everything else. But the one thing that he wasn't willing to give up was the ability to direct what is right and what is wrong. So when Adam and Eve ate that fruit, all of a sudden they surrendered control or they took the control from God to choose what is right and wrong. They wanted to be the judge. They wanted to be the advocate. They wanted to be the ruler of their lives and to be able to choose what is right and wrong instead of actually surrendering that to God. But the funny thing, the very thing that they tried to take for themselves, when they took that control, they actually handed that control from God to the devil and not to themselves. So all of a sudden, they weren't lords over their own lives, but they had just transferred and forfeited control to the devil. It's funny that we often have the ability to choose so many things. In the morning, I chose what breakfast I wanted to eat. This morning, I I chose to wake up and make tea and coffee for for, for Megan and I. Um, Yesterday... I chose to go and have exercise. I need to have a healthy life. We have control to choose so many things in our lives. We have the ability to choose what what school our kids go to. Joshua made a statement in the Old Testament where he actually spoke and chose on behalf of his family. And he said, I choose that my family will surrender, that my household will serve God. The things that we control, the things that we want to Uh, have ambitions for the things that we are dreaming, Joshua said, I'm handing my dreams over to God. I'm surrendering control over to God for my whole entire family. So God, take over. And I think in this past week or two, we've had a realization that we often have anxiety. I thought I was not a stressful person. I thought I, I, I don't generally stress. I don't generally have anxiety. I don't generally have sleepless nights worrying about the future. But I find myself this week really having anxiety about what's going on in the world. And not just from a financial point, but really as a pastor, I'm, I'm having anxiety about the people that I lead, the people that I care for, my friends, my family. And I, I fall asleep at night and then I wake up again worrying about these things. But I realize that if I'm going to be worrying about that, I'm taking control of my choice. Instead of saying, God, I'm going to surrender that to you. I'm going to choose to let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as, it in, as in, in heaven in my life. So God, I'm choosing to surrender my anxiety to you because it's completely outside of my control. And I know in the midst of that, that's, that's an easier thing to say than it is really to do. But I want to challenge us to think about what we think about in these next few weeks. Because as we look at our bank accounts, as we look at our finances, we, we get 
get to the end of the month and we wonder if we're going to have another month, month worth of finances. But if we really believe that God is our provider and God is our healer and God is our father, then really those stresses need to be handed over to God. And that yada, that knowledge, that right to choose needs to be handed over to God and say, God, I'm giving you control of that. It's about the surrendering. Because when we begin to surrender, when we begin to give control over to God for those things in our life, then we begin to activate God's purpose and His plans. We begin to activate His kingdom in our lives. And when we activate His kingdom and we allow Him to take over the things that give us worry, we allow Him to take over the things that give us stress, we allow Him to take over wondering if we'll have the right words, if we'll have the right answers, if we're good enough leaders or if we're good enough husbands or wives or fathers or friends or family, if we're good enough siblings. When we, we, we surrender that control, we begin to activate His kingdom. And His kingdom doesn't have a limit. It doesn't have a ceiling. It doesn't have parameters of operations all we know is that when we give our control over to his kingdom then it begins to overflow out of our lives into other people's lives and so it becomes more contagious than the COVID-19 I believe that the kingdom of God is is more contagious because it preaches hope it preaches joy it it preaches provision it, it preaches happiness it preaches abundance not just from our personal lives, but abundance that overflows into the people that we encounter. But it means that we have to make Him a priority. It means that within our hearts, within our bodies, within our spirits, we need to allow His Spirit to invade our hearts and make His priorities our priorities and not the other way around. In Proverbs 3 verse 5 to 6 it says, Trust in the Lord with all Your heart. With all your heart. Not just part of it. We we, we like to kind of hold on to some parts of our heart because we like to control those things. But the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, not lean not on your own rationale or your own logic or your own economy or, or your own logistical mind, but lean not on your own understanding. And in all ways, See how holistic that statement is. In all ways. How many of us like to carry offense? How many of us have had past hurts? How many of us have been abused by people emotionally, physically? And and the thing that stops us or, or restricts us from actually moving on is our ability to choose to forgive. But the Bible says acknowledge him in all your ways because when you acknowledge him in all your ways the bitterness that you used to carry becomes joy the impossibility of situations all of a sudden become possible the lens that you look at people through in judgment now becomes a lens of mercy and forgiveness and kindness people's abilities aren't measured now by their own ability but what God is doing in their own life and I want to encourage you today that we've got to acknowledge him in all our ways And he shall direct your path. How often do we like to direct our own path? I I know when I go exercising, exercising has suddenly become harder for me right now because I can't go to the gym because in the gym people sweat, right? And and now I'm even more concerned about what things are going to touch me when I don't know what is on that bench, you know? Because people, people carry stuff. So now I've had to become creative on, on how I exercise. So I've been running. So I've now been plotting my path. I've, I've examined how much incline I'm going to be going on because I need to get my heart rate up. Because if I get my heart rate up, I get more points on my discovery app, which means I get more smoothies and more coffees and more meals and more points and more benefits that I can get a free airline ticket or whatever. I, I've realized I'm about a bit OCD and addictive about getting points. So I check my entire path out. And I map and I know exactly when I'm going to get 50 points, 100 points, 200 points, 300 points. And I've worked this thing out. And we kind of tend to carry our lives in the same way. And we know that if we get a certain qualification, that if we meet the certain person, that we do the right thing, then so the points in our life are going to accumulate. And so our bank balance will increase. And so our possessions will increase. But I want us to think a bit differently about how we lead our lives and that who is directing our path. Because the real points that matter are the points that we're accumulating in the kingdom of God. Because the Bible actually talks about the treasures and rewards in heaven. 
Pastor Ant said a statement last week um, when we were talking about the mustard seed. And he said, the potential of what God has for you is determined by how you take what God has given you and put it to use. What has God given you? In the midst of everything that is going on, in the midst of all the chaos and all the worry and all the stress, what has God given you? Because I had a moment this week where I said, what happens if everything fails? I've got no skill set to do. I've got nothing else other than being a pastor. That's all I know how to do. What happens if everything fails? I've got no special gift. But I had to choose to think, no, but God's put something in my life for me to steward, for me to prepare, for me to take possession of, for me to command his kingdom and not my own kingdom over. And when I, I began to think about that differently, all of a sudden my priorities became a bit different. And all of a sudden the choices that I made became a di- di- bit different. And all of a sudden my dreams and my imagination became a bit different. And it's really all about your choice. In that passage in Matthew, it says, five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. I've got to believe that the master briefed them before he left. I've got to believe that when he left, he said, make sure that when I come back, your oil lamps are filled. Make sure that when I come back, you are prepared to light away. Make sure when I come back, you're ready to trim your lamps up to the max so that you won't miss anything out. I've got to believe that he briefed them. And when the Bible talks about the fact that these people were foolish or wise, they had a choice to be foolish or wise. And the wise choice was, let's be prepared. So I've got to ask you today, are you preparing or are you procrastinating? Are you preparing or are you prolonging? Are you preparing or are you delaying? Are you enjoying your kingdom so much that you aren't going to be ready for when His kingdom really arrives because I need to let you know that his kingdom is already here waiting for you to surrender to it because we know that he directs our path. We know that he makes our winding path straight. We know that he gives us a clear vision of hope, kindness, and grace. I've got to think and believe that those foolish were foolish because they made a choice. Pastor Raymond Menchaka always says this. He says, when it's game time, it's too late to practice. And I wonder in this day and time that we're in, that people have got a negative position towards what it feels like to be isolated right now. What it feels like to be stuck in a home, whether you're by yourself or or whether you are with your family, people are finding this isolation quite restricting, quite worrying. Being by yourself, being in your own thoughts can be quite disconcerting and creates all kinds of insecurities and creates all kinds of worries. But I've I've got to tell you this, that today, even Jesus had to withdraw into isolation. Even Jesus had to withdraw into a quiet place. And I wonder if possibly in this isolation, it's actually a moment for us to prepare. It's actually a moment for us to get ready. It's it's actually a moment for for us to say, God, I know that you are going to turn this bad situation into a good and I'm going to be ready when the doors open up and I need to be stepping out. I'm going to be ready. My spirit is going to be overflowing because I've surrendered my heart to you. I've surrendered my kingdom to you. I've surrendered my choice to you. God, would you give me the wisdom? God, would you give me the discernment to know what is right and wrong by your spirit and not my own? God, would you help me to choose? Not anxiety or fear, but God, would you choose, help me to choose boldness and courage and perseverance? God, would you help me to choose the lens that I look at these situations from? God, when you're turning the impossible to possible, when you are in turn, where you are turning insecurity into security, when you are turning fear into courage, when you are, are turning anxiety into boldness, 
Because God, I don't want to be like the fool that was in this passage. But God, I want to be like the wise person. I want my oil to be overflowing. God, I want my spirit to be overflowing. Even more now, God, I pray that I would be ready to lend a word because there are people that are depressed. There are people that are scared. God, there are people that are starving. Right now, God, would you give me an ability to discern in your spirit? Would you give me a word of knowledge? Would you help me to be prepared, God? Not that I'm withdrawing because I'm worried, but I'm withdrawing into your spirit and into your presence because where your presence is, there your kingdom remains. Because the Bible says that where two or more are gathered, there his presence is, there his kingdom is. And just because you are alone at home today, doesn't mean his kingdom isn't there. Doesn't mean his presence isn't there because as much as we aren't gathered physically, right now we are gathered in spirit. Right now we are gathered in heart. Right now we are gathered in mission. I need to reassure you that today you are not alone. But today you are filled with a spirit of boldness. Today you are overflowing with his kingdom because today whether you have made a choice or you have now made a choice, to let his kingdom come and let his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because the reason why Jesus withdrew wasn't because he was scared. He was scared, but the reason why he withdrew wasn't because it was because he didn't want to let his flesh overwhelm what his father had asked him to do. He withdrew because he didn't want his flesh and his worry to overwhelm the promise and the purpose that God had put in his heart that he was created and designed for. He withdrew so that he could be greater connected to the Father. So he could lean onto his understanding and not be worried about his rationale, but lean onto his Father's understanding and lead onto his Father's guidance because he knew his Father's heart. And his father's heart wasn't one of fear and timidity, but his father's heart was one of boldness and courage and provision and joy and making the impossible possible of of, of favor and faith and trust. I want to encourage you today that if you're worrying, here is his word. If you are anxious, here are his promises. If you are stressing, here is his favor. And if you're worried and you're isolated, here is his community. Here is his church. All you have to do is go into the, take the directions that Megan gave earlier in the service. Make a phone call. Contact us. Let us connect you with a small group to know that you don't have to walk alone, but within his community, as his Bible says, As iron sharpens iron, so man sharpens man. We're there to encourage each other. There's WhatsApp groups happening all over the city. There is virtual cell groups happening all over our country right now because people want to stay connected. Because when we stay connected, we stay connected with the Father and His guidance and His hope and His blessing and His future. Because I want to say this to you. The Master doesn't want us to be fools. Our King doesn't want us to be ignorant. He wants us to be wise. He wants us to be prepared. And right now, He wants you to know that He loves you, that you have not been left alone. Because his word says, in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. 